and I'm here to talk a little bit about what we're doing with Clojure as part of the Ocean Protocol project. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to spend a, a little bit of time saying what it is that we're doing with Ocean because it is quite an interesting proposition, it's completely new, it's something we're, we're, we're launching early next year. Um, so I'd love to share a little bit about what we're doing. And then I think get on to the more interesting stuff, which is, okay, we're building a very core part of the product using Clojure. And I'd like to show you um, how we're doing it, some of the techniques, how it works, some maybe some ideas for people to try out in your different projects as well. So um, what, is, what is Ocean? Ocean, we, we just describe it as a, a decentralized data exchange protocol to unlock data for AI. And... I think Ocean came out of some observations and the observation was that in the AI space you've got these amazing startups, researchers, you've got great machine learning algorithms, they can do amazing things with you know, the deep learning and generative networks and all of this stuff. Um, but they haven't really got much data and if you want to get good results out of machine learning models you need to have a lot of data. And particularly when you're doing predictive models, this kind of stuff, the more data you have, the better your model is going to be. Data beats algorithms when it comes to modeling quality. And at the same time, you've got all of these multinationals and governments that are sitting on vast amounts of data, but really haven't got the skills or the talent, AI talent, to actually take advantage of it all. And often the data is like locked up in silos, even within those organizations. So, you know, they can't actually bring it together and do anything useful with it. And as a result of this, there's only a few companies that are really maximizing the value out of AI right now. You've got your Googles, Facebooks, the people who both have a lot of data and a lot of engineering skills in-house that they can actually take advantage of it. And the challenge ultimately is how do you actually decentralize data so that you don't have to have all this vast amount of data under your own arms in order to take advantage of, of AI. And Ocean is founded really on a vision of, you know, uh, liberating data so that AI can really achieve its full potential and that everyone can participate in it. It's not just going to be a monopoly between a few companies. So Ocean was founded by two companies working together. One is uh, Dex, which is a company based here in Singapore, um, been here for a few years and has done a lot of um, data marketplaces, so traditional marketplaces for data sharing. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to any of the hackathons in Singapore. They support a lot of the hackathons with like, uh, you know, data sets and gathering data and data sharing agreements. And the other company is BigchainDB, which is a Berlin-based blockchain company. Um, so, yes, we have, we have some blockchain in this one. Um, so, I always think when if, if you've been in functional programming for a while, the blockchain you always find is vaguely amusing because it's basically just a long link, linked list, immutable... Yeah, been there, done that. Um, but we are using blockchain. We're, using, uh, we're using, using blockchain to help build the substrate for the Ocean Protocol. And I'll say a little bit about why we're doing that. I mean, basically, data sharing has been done for years, but it's a messy business. Yeah, you often have to have these very complex, bespoke data sharing agreements. There's tons of lawyers involved. There's lots of contracts to write. You often have to build some custom technology, agree what you're going to deploy where, who's going to open what ports. It just gets messy and complicated, particularly if you're trying to do it securely. And this makes it, this is a barrier. This is, what, this is one of the big inhibitors to actually sharing data. And what we're trying to do with Ocean is basically to look at, a, well, what, what's it going to look like in a decentralized future? Well, first of all, we can't have all of this manual building of new solutions every time what someone wants to share data. We want to have a protocol. Yeah, a way of sharing data that's efficient and um, well-specified and means that you can actually automate these data sharing processes. Um, we want to be able to create a markets for data. So, I mean, you've got, it's a, it is ultimately a market. You've got people who have data and you've got people who want data. So we want to create uh, the ability for uh, incentives and market incentives to actually help people to trade data effectively. Uh, the blockchain gives us um, the ability to that exchange value in that way and it also gives us um, an immutable provenance yeah what, exactly what transactions happened and this is very important in many in many cases if you look at things like for example 
uh, clinical trials, medical research data. If you're building a, a medical device and you want to put AI in your device and that's going to control the dosage of drugs given to a patient, you better be sure you know where that data came from, how that model was trained, exactly what the provenance of that was because you know there's some significant uh, patient risks if you get if you get if you get this stuff wrong. Likewise in finance as audit requirements etc etc. Um, Blockchain also gives us the opportunity to do things like cryptographic proofs, like can you prove that someone delivered the service that they said they were going to. Uh, and this is a lot better than having people manually check and having some kind of you know, legal dispute or you know, a commercial dispute resolution process at the end. And um, the blockchain gives us a token, a, a way of actually exchanging value and a way of actually buying and selling data. And I think the final point is, you know, instead of having these sort of point-to-point -point integrations where company A says we're going to sign a data sharing agreement with company B, we actually want an open ecosystem. Yeah, so everyone can participate and, um, you know, everyone's on a decentralized level playing field. And that's a lot of words. I mean, I think I'd just like to draw an analogy very quickly. Um, we talked about the tr exchanging data, um, but a good analogy is, in fact, the trade in... Uh, um, this is a global trade in manufactured and physical goods. Yeah, so world, world uh, uh, merchandise trade. And what you can see from this data is that around 1970, there's this sort of explosive growth in, in, in world, world trades kicks off. And anyone, anyone know what happened in 1970? Wasn't born. Wasn't born. Surely you're, surely you're a student of economic history. You've seen these things, no? Yeah. Um, okay, so um, what happened in 1970? Um, some people say shipping containers. And that is actually very, very close. Um, it is to do with shipping containers. But shipping containers existed a long time before 1970. What actually happened in 1970 is they standardized the containers, yeah? So instead of having all different containers of different sizes and different shapes and different materials, um, they said, okay, we're gonna define some standard container sizes. Docker. Hmm? They all started using Docker. They started using Docker, exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, so ISO, ISO, ISO did Docker way before, way before Docker did. Um, but the point about having a standard on these things is containers work if you don't have a standard. But if you want to build infrastructure that uses containers, moves them around, lifts them off ships, uh, big ships designed to fit the, the max, most efficient possible number of containers, the infrastructure around containers requires standard sizes to be used. And that's what we're trying to do with Ocean effectively, create, you know, the the standard for um, data exchange. And the result of that, of course, is we want to be able to create like supply chains of data. I won't go into the details of this, but this is like a healthcare case where you've got some patient data that you want to use to predict the risk of disease or, you know, like risk of stroke, risk of heart attacks, etc., which is um, uh, an important thing to be able to predict, but you need data to train the models in order to actually create accurate predictions. And a principle of Ocean is that some of the, the data can stay within the secure environments of the healthcare providers or, or a secure third party, and it never actually needs to get revealed to the other, other parties in the ecosystem. So how does it work? We've basically got at the centre of the network, we've got um, keepers and verifiers who are basically running the actual blockchain part. Um, but that's really just the core. Around that we have, um, I guess, what does the heavy lifting in the ecosystem is data marketplaces. So you can actually go to discover data, buy data, trade data, uh, and service providers. So service providers could be like providing storage, or they could be providing compute. Don't know if anyone, anyone uses Spark? Yeah? Okay, so it could be like a Spark compute cluster, could be a service provider providing compute operations on some big data sets. Um, and then around that, you've got all the users in the ecosystem. So people publishing data, people consuming data, curators, referrers, etc. 
So it's an ecosystem model. I mean, as, as Ocean Protocol, we're trying to define the standard. We are not going to build all of the solutions or all, all of this. It's going to be totally open source, so everyone can build what they like on top of, on top of the standard. Um, there is a token um, which is um, implemented in the network, which is a means of value exchange. So you can say, if you provide me this data set, I'll pay you 10 tokens or, or whatever. It's like, a, I think of it like a fairground token, you know, when you have like the ride tokens, and it lets, lets you go around the Ferris wheel. Okay, so we'll get some more interesting techie stuff. Um, so this is kind of the arch very simplified architecture of a traditional data marketplace. You would have a publisher and a consumer basically um, uploading an asset into, a, into storage and downloading it after the asset has been purchased. And it's just one central location, uh, which is fine. I mean, it works. The, the thing is that that's, that only works on some assumptions. So the assumption is both the cons publishers and consumers are going to come to the same marketplace. Maybe, maybe not. And it also assumes that they're willing to store their assets, their data in the marketplace. They're trusting that centralized authority to protect their assets for them. So that works for some people, but you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't scale very well. Um, a next step would be to actually add a blockchain on the bottom of this. And um, it's, so it's the same architectural model but instead of, instead of just having the marketplace, you now have the advantage of having a, a decentralized network so you can actually check the provenance. So it's a public chain. You can actually say what transactions happened and anyone can verify that. You don't need to trust the marketplace. Yeah, that's a, that's a publicly verifiable um, thing. So it, it, it's, it's already given you some greater decentralization and the ability to trust actors in the ecosystem more. And you, you want to get paid if you're selling an asset. Um, but it's still got the problem that all the data is being stored in this, this one centralized um, place. And of course, the data is getting downloaded. Now, some data you actually don't want to give the consumer the raw data. And a good example of this is like healthcare data, yeah, where, you know, there's great value in the healthcare data for training AI models, um, but most in most countries, in most medical um, you know, uh, clinical institutions, they're not allowed to share the data. You know, it's patients' private data, and they can't give it out to third parties. So the next extension is to do things like trusted compute. So in this case, we're saying um, the data goes into a secure environment, some kind of um, secure trusted third party and the data itself the the gray the gray box never actually leaves this environment it stays in situ in that environment and the only thing that a consumer can do is they can request some algorithm gets run on that data and they get to see the results yeah so the compute is actually being done within a secure environment and this is a big improvement yeah because this now means that uh, a publisher can can create value from their data without that data ever 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 going getting out released into the wild, where you know there'd be maybe a breach of their legal or or ethical obligations. And this is actually useful in a lot of cases. Yeah, um, it's a very generic model of computation. Um, so the output could be like an aggregate. You've done like a gr select group by, you've got some aggregate results that you want to do in some business intelligence. It could be uh, a model training. So you run it on the training data and the outputs is in fact a trained model or the weights for a neural network or something like that. It could be a data cleaning operation. Yeah, so you, you're, you're removing bad records or you're, um, you're, you're filtering the records in some way and creating a subset of data that is you know, appropriate to be delivered to the, to the end customer. So it's a very flexible model. A lot of real world use cases can actually be uh, addressed with this kind of model. Um, of course, it's still putting everything in one place. Yeah, it's still got this sort of secure enclave. So the ultimate goal is to get to a point where we have fully decentralized services. So a publisher and consumer can use different marketplaces. There'll be service providers offering storage. Um, there'll be service providers offering compute and algorithms. And different people in the ecosystem can add value in whatever way makes sense. Let's say you're a startup 
and you've got amazing algorithms for data pre-processing and cleaning. Yeah, maybe boring, but that's actually extremely valuable. If you've ever done any data science, you know how important it is to have good, clean data. So they could actually just sell that service and that's all they do. And people can then piece together the different services, the different data assets to sort of deliver whatever kind of solution or what kind of output they want. And that's what we mean when we say we're heading towards a really decentralized model of, 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 of data supply chains. And of course, it's all enabled by the protocol and by the, and by the network, which actually tracks the progress of all activities through that, through that chain. Okay. Um, I think the final important principle to emphasize is that um, the control of assets is always the choice of the publisher. Yeah, a publisher can decide whether they want their data to be free and open data so anyone in the world can see it, or whether they want to keep it private and they only want to ena enable you know, other people to um, send them a query or something which they will then answer. Yeah? So in some cases you want the data to be spread far and wide. In some cases you want to keep the data yourself and let other people send the algorithms to you. Yeah. So I think of it a bit like lambda calculus. Yeah. If the, the, the data assets are like values and the algorithms are like functions and it's up to the people building solutions in Ocean to figure out how to assemble them together into something that, 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 that works for them. Um, so anyway, that's, that's an introduction to Ocean and what we're doing and what, and, and, and what we're building. Uh, we, I guess I'll just transition into the more interesting part, which is to talk about what we're building in, in Clojure, and I'll, I'll show some of the code and, and, and how some of that works. So we're using Clojure to build the core of our reference marketplace in implementation. So I talked about having data marketplaces which can allow people to trade, to trade data. Uh, we're using Clojure for the back end of that, of that, of that component, uh, which is a really, really critical component. That's effectively where the buyers and sellers come together to trade, to list assets, um, and to um, uh, discover assets. So, you know, you can imagine a, a lot of functionality is getting, getting, getting built into this. Um, so we use Clojure for that. The blockchain itself uses um, a, a language called Solidity, if anyone's come across that. Um, the front end uses JavaScript. Some of the service providers use Python. Some of the service providers use Clojure. There's, we've got a really polyglot set of uh, languages in use. Um, but that's actually a strength, yeah? Because we're not trying to build a single stack. We're trying to build a protocol where different components can interoperate. So it's actually really helpful to test out different languages and make sure that the, the ecosystem is interoperable on that basis. Yeah, there shouldn't be any dependency on having a particular particular language. Okay, so I'll, I'll switch into some code. Um, so I think a few things I wanted to, I wanted to show, and I think the easiest way to do is actually to. So what I've done is I've just I've just run this or run this already. Um, I've got basically uh, an HTTP kit web server running local running locally um, and that's serving up a few a few pages uh, i'll just show you what it's what it's what it's serving so this is the back end so I'll, i can maybe show some if you've got some time i'll show the front end later but what's interesting is we have this um swagger ui yeah where we basically list all the API endpoints. Anyone seen the Swagger UI stuff before? Yeah. Yes. You're all familiar with it? Okay. Control Plus. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, okay. So this is, um, this is your standard Swagger API. If I want to find out what metadata is, exists on the Server so at the moment, I've got all of these different metadata mm -hmm. assets. So these are the IDs for the, the assets. If I want to see the metadata for that one, for example, it's probably a test asset. Um, do, 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 do. Yeah, it's a test asset. Um, so but <coughs> basically, it's a fully, func fully functioning um, 
API that basically allows you to, any any client. So the client could either be a web application or it could be someone using like programming tools, yeah, and like just doing remote requests to the to to the to the API. Um, it's got a bunch of different features. So there's a storage subset of the API. Um, don't can't remember if this asset has anything stored against it. Oh, yes, it did. Okay, so it's got a it's got a it's got a it's got a file associated with that asset that I can download. So uh, can, can, can you before I go in further? Can, yeah. can you uh, give us an example what an asset could be? So an asset could be it could be anything in any 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 data, but an asset is most likely to be a data set of some form. So it could be like a big CSV file. Or it could be a uh, image file. It could be a video. It could. Be, I mean, it's 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 HTTP. Yeah, it's like you've got a MIME content type, and you can basically put any blob of bytes with a content type you like as an as an asset. Obviously, then depending on the consumer, they'd have to interpret that asset. Um, but you know, things like CSV would be would be common. Yeah. Um, so anything can anything can be basically stored as an asset. Uh, the assets all have metadata which describe them, and the metadata can include things like you know provenance, how that asset was created, and and you can have like links to sample files or to um, descriptions or you know more human readable uh, in, interfaces, which is just more convenient stuff for the user. Um, but the core <coughs> the core is basically an asset has an ID and it has a blob of data associated with that ID and that has a cryptographic hash so that you can validate that the actual data is you know what you expected yeah and that ID can also be you know stored on the blockchain so that you can you can actually validate okay this metadata described this asset which then had this cryptographic hash and then I validate the data so everything can actually be validated and traced back um, through effectively you know cryptographic hash functions so it's, um, it's like a tree. Um, it's, like a, it's almost like Git. Yeah, where you have a tree and the hash, the hash of the head determines all of the things that are stored within the, within, within the asset. Um, has anyone used Composure API before? Okay, a couple. So this is, this is basically using Composure API. So apologies for people who have seen this before, but um, it, it, it's quite a nice little bit of closure magic. Um, yeah. So <coughs> it's a bit like um, it's a bit it's a variant of Composure if anyone's used that, but it automatically does a lot of stuff for you, like translating JSON, like um, uh, setting up parameters, and most importantly, it creates the 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 Swagger files for you. So I've got this this particular one set up so that. Um, if I want to, what am I doing? I'm just going to hack the storage API very quickly. If I want to create a new endpoint, uh, gets, oops, gets foobar. Uh, yeah, so that's that. So this is this is ring. So it's basically um, a ring response. So has it, everyone used ring a bit? A little bit. Okay. So it's, it's just it's just standard ring stuff. And if I, oops, don't need headers. Okay. So all I did is I hit reload. Yeah. So it's just reloaded this this namespace. And if I go to the Swagger UI, assuming everything's worked, yeah, okay, I've got a new, I've got a new, uh, new endpoint. So this is amazing workflow for when you're actually developing the API and you're you're debugging and you're just trying to test things. You know, I'm, I'm not restarting anything. I'm not having to rebuild the server. I didn't even stop the server. Yeah, so the server. I, <coughs> I've just got an atom that basically. A var, in fact, 
where you, you switch over the old version of the handler for the new version of the handler and it's effectively atomic and it's, you, you, you're then running... What do, you, what, do you, what do you use for that? Do you use like closure tools uh, thing to, to reload all the, all the modules? Or? Uh, so all I reloaded was this namespace. Yeah. So I've actually... When, one of my principles when I'm coding Clojure is always to write things in a way that a reload does the most useful possible thing. Yeah? Are you using like a server component? Yeah, I'll show you the trick at the bottom. Um, so, I basically have, um, so when I hit reload, it's going to re reprocess all of this. So this, set of roots is basically creating the composure the composure roots that includes creating all of the um, web web roots then the api roots any middleware so there's the usual cause stuff and somewhere in here it's got the um uh the swagger generation piece forget where it is now yeah swagger roots so you you, t you tell you tell it where where you want the swagger stuff to be inserted in the roots. So when you hit reload on this particular namespace, it just rebuilds the whole thing from the top to the bo bo bottom and redefines app. Now app is getting referenced in, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna have to find this. Yeah, there we are. So I'm using system, so Stuart Sierra's component library. It's actually a super simple system. I'm only really using it for the web server at the moment. I might use it for the database going forward, but web server's fine. And you give it the handler function. So this is a complete hack. Um, you basically wrap it in a function so that when you reload the namespace, app gets to use the new version. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an ugly hack, but it, it, it works. So you should be able, if, if you just put uh, surfer.handler app there, rather than, the, uh, rather than the closure, it wouldn't reload. Yeah, because it would put in... You'd have to reload both, yeah. But then this is the system, so you don't want the system to be restarting when you reload the namespace. So, um, so yeah, that's just a hack to make sure it goes through the the the, the, the function lookup. Yeah. Um, so this kind of stuff I try and keep hidden away from the, the logic of the code. This is like the nasty stuff that like don't touch this. If you touch this, everything's going to break. So, so it's, it's part part of your. The code that you're, the application code that you're working on. So if I want to take that out for my production, yes. if if I want to package it for my production, do I take it out? Um, so I I have a really simple way of packaging for production on this one, which is I just have a um, a main class which starts the system. Is, is literally that, yeah, it's just basically starting the web server, mm -hmm. yeah? And because all the dependencies go through the namespaces, that does all of the setup of the handlers and everything like that. Um, and you can stop it and you can, you know, you can do all the, the usual system reloaded, reloaded stuff. But the most useful trick is, is, is that, that sort of indirect lookup of the handler so that, so that you can basically reload this namespace and have sort of instant, instant, instant refresh. So it will be packaged together. Yeah, so basically <coughs> you can package the whole thing, you can do a... Um, or maybe the question, I, the reason I yeah. ask is usually you have things like this that you, you uh, on the fly changes, then probably the system will behave slower. So when you do a production, this, this doing development yeah, is I fine, right? The function is called only once, right? Only yeah, once. It, it, the, the overhead of this is so tiny, mm -hmm. yeah? so. I mean, if you think about a web request, um, you know, if you maybe 
maybe you're handling 5,000 web, web requests a second or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something like that. The overhead of a function call in Clojure, so like um, this, is I think about 10 nanoseconds. It, it, it's, it's, of that, it's of that order. Yeah, it's just completely negligible. And um, the nice thing is when I do that reload, all of the handler is getting recompiled. It's not like you're interpreting it. It's basically compiling a new version of that, of that, of that handler and creating the swagger. I mean, you can see how fast it is, yeah? I mean, it's like, this is, um, I'll just recompile it. Oops. Go to watch, watch the bottom bit and see how long it takes for the, uh, the, the app to come up again. Uh, go. Yeah, about a second. Yeah, so that's what it takes to compile the uh, all all of the handlers. So it is called per request. See? The, that function, that indirection is called once once per request. request. About 10, 10 nanoseconds overhead. I mean, it's about it's probably less less nano less time than converting a number to a string or vice versa. Yeah, it's like just tiny compared to J the compared to the overhead of passing the JSON is just, <laughs> you can ignore it. I mean, JSON parsing is in fact probably the biggest cost in this entire system. Um, yeah. uh, maybe database, but that's been pretty fast so far. So yeah, so it's, an, it's, a, it's, a, nice, it's a nice setup basically using uh, Composure API and all of this to, uh, um, to develop that. Um, I'll just, very quickly, I, I, I'm conscious I'm probably running over time, but um, if I just, uh, da, 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 da. this is, uh, da, da, da. yeah, so we have, we have also a, a front end. This is a JavaScript front end. It's basically talking to exactly that, those same APIs. Um, what's great about this is that we can open source the two separately. And if people want to customize the front end, customize the browser, the marketplace, the way that people interact with it, they can do that independent of all the back-end APIs. So we're trying to keep this very clear division of responsibilities in the, in, in the system. But you can see we've got a whole bunch of different, uh, um, bit, different uh, bits of data which have been uploaded, MRI data. And you know, it describes the data. Um, I don't think there's any sample on that one. From the ledger. Sorry? Your ledger is from the uh, It will be, yes. <coughs> So we're still in development. The network will actually go live in March next year. Yeah. So you can't do anything with tokens or anything like that yet. Um, but we're getting pretty close to being able to, for free open data, to be able to like run a marketplace. So most of the data they, they drop will be encrypted by the um, Well, I mean, it's, it all goes... Uh, it would all normally be encrypted. I mean, open data, obviously, you don't you don't care. But yes, it could. It would norm. We normally expect people to encrypt their data. So, so my question is: is through the ledger, is it is will it be supported out of the box where I put some encrypted data and then I only share the key for a particular participant kind of thing? Um, <coughs> this one is yeah, useful. This will be yeah. Um, so I think the important thing about the, the blockchain is all of the current blockchain technologies um, have the issue that they're not very fast. In fact, they're painfully slow, yeah? Um, so the amount of, the challenge of doing any serious data applications on the blockchain, I mean, it's just currently not feasible. So our solution is to say, okay, we're going to have the decentralized keeper network, which is basically tracking what happens. Yeah. So it's just saying this transaction happened, this asset was traded, but it's not storing the asset data itself because that would be too large. It would be too cumbersome. You know, you wouldn't be able to afford putting it out on the, uh, on the whole network. So the, the keeper network is tracking the provenance, tracking the transactions, but it doesn't actually see the actual data. The actual data gets stored in these agents which are playing different worlds in the ecosystem, which is why getting these APIs 
is really important because that's how these agents interact with each, with each other. Um, so you can all think of the keepers, we're really genuinely using it as a distributed ledger, public ledger. Um, we're not using it for actual data processing or data storage. Yeah. We thought about it, but we came to the conclusion that that wasn't, wasn't feasible using current blockchain technology. So can more than one agent provide the same data or the same file? Yes. Yes. Providing the publishers permitted them to. Yeah. And if one goes down, it'll automatically find the other copy? Um, that is a very interesting question. That would actually depend on the client. So if the client knows where alternatives to search for, then it could. Um, but we're trying to avoid creating sort of a central, single central point of failure when it comes to the database. Yeah, so um, we're probably not going to try and list every single asset provider relationship in a single place. So those relationships won't be on the Keeper Network? Um, some of them may be, but they won't be mandatory. Yeah, so it'd be possible that some of those get stored in the market. The marketplace plays a key role here, yeah? So the marketplace is storing the listings of the assets, what assets are available and who's providing them, yeah? Okay. So um, the use case we're expecting to be most common is that people pick a marketplace, search a marketplace. They can pay, maybe use multiple marketplaces if they want to, but the marketplace will be like the go-to place for like your directory of available assets. So it's not a decentralized market? Um, what do you mean by decentralized? I mean the whole network doesn't know about every asset. The whole network You have to go to a specific marketplace to search for a specific asset, is that true? Or um, it, 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 depend, it depends in fact on what, what the marketplaces want to do. So a marketplace could easily index other marketplaces. Yeah? Right. So. You could see someone saying, okay, I'm, go I'm going to be like a Google of marketplaces and I'm just going to index them and I'm going to record what assets are in each but place. index doesn't live on the uh, graph. Basically. Doesn't live, it, well, it doesn't have to live on the blockchain. I mean, you could, you probably Only could. the participants, like marketplace as a participant in there. And then yeah. Consumers and producers are participants. So it's just an economy across time. Yeah, so the, the blockchain really is for the identity of the, of the actors. So who's there? Yeah, wh where are my endpoints? I've got to actually be able to find one of these end agents who, who, that I want to talk to. So blockchain is used for a directory of, of, of agents, effectively. And it's also used for uh, transactions. So if I buy an asset, yeah, it, some of my tokens go into a scrow until the service provider delivers me an access token for the asset, and then the, they get the token, they get the tokens once they've delivered it. Uh, and you can do more sophisticated things like you can have um, dispute resolution procedures in the, in the smart contracts if you want. Yeah, like, um, and you can also have cryptographic proofs. So sometimes you might want a cryptographic proof of delivery or this kind, this kind of thing. So there's a few different, there's a, it's actually very flexible. You can, uh, there's a cool article about it, service execution agreements. And basically you can create a little graph of, of, of conditions that need to be met for a service to be executed. And it's, Pretty flexible, in fact. So you could almost design different workflows for different kinds of services to be provided, and that's on chain because because it has to be because in, um, in order to actually do the token transaction and in order to make sure that the payment only gets released at the right time once all the conditions have been met, it has to be on chain. So those are those are the main things that you know uh, absolutely must be on chain in order to make the whole system work. What if, if I want this transaction to be um, blacked out from others, uh, from the public? This is a public chain, right? So it's a public chain. So the thing about a public chain is any token transaction would be visible. Yeah. Although you may be pseudonymous. So you don't have to tell anyone else your accounts. Yeah. So it's just like a... Rant. It does say that who I buy from. Let's say anonymous A buy from company A, right? <laughs> Yeah, anonymous A buy from company B, then you know there's some transaction for company A. It'll be uh, an anonymous A bought from anonymous B um, using this agent. And if that agent mm -hmm. is also not revealing any information about itself, it's a pretty anonymous transaction. But producer cannot be anonymous, right? Uh, 
how, how do we not cannot be anonymous? I mean, technically can be anonymous, but if I'm a producer of data, I would rather yeah. let people know. Who Probably I'm yes. Who yeah. Probably. So the mo we think <coughs> the most common case is a publisher is going to want their de their metadata to be public because basically if people discover it, it's like it's like being on Google. Yeah, mm -hmm. you want Google to index your search page so that you can get more you can get more customers. Yeah, it's going to be exactly the same with data marketplaces. Most of the time, publishers want people to know about their assets. They want people to see their assets. They want their people to search for their assets. There may be a few cases where people say. Um, I'm doing a private internal data transfer between, you know, trusted parties or within my company and I'm quite happy for that to be anonymous. So some people will want that, but most of the time if it's like trading an asset or trying to sell an asset, it would be publicly visible. Yeah. Will it support uh, trading off blockchain like Lightning uh, Network? Where are you familiar with Lightning? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, to be determined, I think. Um, so for the the main, uh, we're currently going with a parity network, parity based network. Um, there may be there may be some options to do that in the future. And is it tied to one specific blockchain implementation, or can you you hook it into something else? Is it Ocean itself is an open standard or an open protocol? Yeah. So um, we are, have are building the version one using a parity based network, so power to EVM. Right. So it's um, it's user solidity, it's like effectively Ethereum Ethereum virtual machine, but the power to network the power to technology has some cool features that give us some extra extra um, extra capabilities. Sure. So uh, could it in the future evolve to use different blockchain networks or different substrates or even run completely off chain? Yes, absolutely it could. Yeah. So um, obviously, at different parts of the stack would have to be modified to account for that. But yeah, you could you could you could link it with un with other networks, or you could. About, there's nothing to stop a marketplace ultimately integrating a you know some kind of payment provider and like you know doing you know normal currency currency payments as well. Right. Obviously, that you lose some of the cryptographic guarantees when you do that, but you know maybe that's more convenient for certain kinds of users. So you know. We're trying to build the protocol like the, you know the HTTP, and then we're you know it, it's open for people to innovate on how they use it and what kind of solutions they build on top. And you mentioned uh, identity is quite important, obviously, like verification. How, how do you ensure that someone's physical identity matches their digital identity? Is that like to provide like an identity provider? Like um, it helps into a government ID, or do you have do you have to like copy someone's digital signature and say I trust this key? So I mean, it's it's. We I think it's one of these cases where there's levels of trust. Yeah. So we actually allow someone to use the network with nothing but a public key, or you know, equivalent of an Ethereum account, which is effectively a public key. Yeah. Uh, so you're effectively pseudonymous using a key like that. Yeah. And that's enough to be able to transact. Yeah. So you can transact on the network, providing you can sign sign transactions and that you can have an account and you can move move ocean tokens into in, into it so you could it supports that sort of anonymous usage but obviously for some of the more trusted use cases like uh, you could imagine a marketplace for clinical researchers saying unless you are a qualified medical researcher at a registered institution we're not going to let you into the marketplace and you're not going to be able to buy any of the assets on this, mar on, on this marketplace. And obviously that would require real world identity checks and, and verification. Yeah. Right. So who would do that? Would it be, would it be like Dex or uh, someone with a root certificate? That would be... So do the check and sign verified accounts? Or that would typically be a marketplace operator. Yeah. Right. So if, because we imagine different marketplaces having very different rules. So a healthcare marketplace in the EU is going to have very different um, rules from, let's say, you know, a, a finance data marketplace operating in Thailand. Yeah, they're just they're just going to be they're just going to be very different. They're going to have different rules about who can join. They're going to have different rules about what terms and conditions need to apply, etc. So um, we imagine the marketplace operators effectively defining the policies and protocols for stuff like verification of, of 
identity if they need it. Now we'd obviously say the rule of identity is you should only demand as much identity information as is strictly necessary. Not a technical question, but yeah. do you have marketplace agreements? Are they are people building marketplaces right now? Yes. Yeah. There's about well. In, in progress, yeah. The network obviously isn't isn't live yet, but there are plenty of people wanting to build marketplaces. So quite involved to come up, build the marketplace and operate it. Yeah, uh, yeah it's a reasonable sized job. I mean, it's um, we're trying to make it easy by building building a nice closure reference implementation that then people can take that and customize it. Yeah. So the plan is that if they want to give, give it a different look, if they want to change the access rules, if they want to... Be a turnkey-ish marketplace app. Close. I mean, it will, it will require configuration. But it's one of the beauties of Clojure, yeah? I mean, everything's data-driven, yeah? So, you know, there's just going to be a big Eden map where you can say, okay, I want to turn this option on, this option off. And, that, and you can let people actually make the decisions on how they want to operate and run their, run their marketplace. So, um, you know, stuff like, is it open to the public? Simple question. That should be a true or false somewhere in a configuration file. And th th that, that, that kind of thing, I think we can make relatively flexible for marketplace operators. Obviously, if they want to do something completely new and different, they'll have to actually go make code changes. But a, a lot of the common requirements, I think, can be met through like config files. So if they make the so the code changes, right? So we will be like to a pull request back to the if it's if it if it's good, yeah. Why not? It's open source, yeah. So it's all Apache two license. Um, uh, so obviously we think people will create improvements. Uh, some of those will go back into the into the main line. Maybe someone will create a better will create a better version. Maybe someone's going to do something better in Haskell. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, 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 that's the great thing about having a, you know a standard protocol people can innovate around the different possible implementations and the different possible use cases. Mm. Because so, so sometimes standard protocol, right? I mean, you, you uh, allow people to change to suit their needs so that you get used uh, at various places, right? So at some point that the change like so s s uh, specific to a group of companies, maybe two or three guys, that they have their own set of standards. They based on yeah. the the ocean protocol, but they have additional fields that you know not compatible with the other guy that using it. In the end of the day, they look like it, but it's not it. So it's it's hard to like so called a standardized protocol by the end of the day. You know, it, it, it's just yeah. like HTTP. Suddenly like <coughs> people have different tags and stuff like that. And then you know, you know, back to the web browser days, you have different tags and stuff. And then it's like a standard, but not a standard. So how how do you actually? I, I think, I mean, I'm not saying we've got it perfect yet, but we're trying to be very specific about which things are required <coughs> versus where in the protocol is it open for extension. So, for example, in, <coughs> in the metadata describing an asset, there's an additional information section where people can put whatever they want. It's like arbitrary JSON. Yeah, they can just put a big map of properties. And we're not prescribing any of that and different parts of the ecosystem may decide hey we're going to we're going to put color as one of those properties and for some reason color is an important property in their in their sort of field mm -hmm. fine yeah we, we we can't actually predict all the possible metadata or all the possible tags that people might want to apply so we tried to make sure there's flexibility uh, built into the protocol in, in appropriate areas so people can uh, define their own sort of variants, if you like. But that's still compatible with the standard, that's still compatible with the protocol. So the protocol just says unspecified and then it's up to people to decide how they want to use it. And obviously if people use the same standard then they'll be able to, you know, merge each other's data and read, and read it. But then that will be something which a sort of sub-community would coordinate on or not coordinate on. If it's valuable, people would probably coordinate. Mm -hmm. So, my, my last question, we're running out of time. So, but, uh, uh, how is your company going to monetize this? Good question. Um, so, uh, first of all, Ocean Foundation is a non-profit. 
Singapore-based non-profit, <coughs> and it's got a mission to basically create a protocol, open source protocol that everyone can use. Um, the development of the protocol was funded, uh, has been funded by um, uh, pre-sale of tokens. So effectively we raise money through pre-selling a chunk of ocean tokens to fund the work that DEX and Big Chain are do, DB are doing, building the ocean network and the, and the, and the, and the protocol and the various different reference implementations. Um, so <coughs> that's to get it started. The Ocean Post sort of Foundation obviously continues in its sort of governance role. Um, uh, in DEX specifically, I think we would see ourselves as becoming, um, I think probably something more like a red hat model. Yeah, so professional open source, where we help organizations make the most of the protocol, uh, build solutions on top of the protocol, um, maybe do like a marketplace operator, let's say a government wants to operate a marketplace, but maybe hasn't got the skills to do a lot of complex customizations in house, we'll say, okay, we can help you with that. Yeah, so it's professional open source model, effectively. Uh, especially if Claudia. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Tokens are a, a fixed pool or? Fixed pool. Yeah, so there's 1.14 billion ocean tokens, which is, I'm told, reliably, that's the number of cubic kilometers of meter in the oceans, of, of water in, in the oceans. Stupid fact. I never counted, so I can't.